this is a day that the Lord has made. And because he made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. If you have breath in your body, if you was able to blink your eyes today, that's two reasons for you to give God some praise on this evening. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. We welcome you to another night of Powerful Life Bible Study here at the Bella Vista Church, where the pastor is Jakar P. Davis, and I'm serving with my co labor Dr. Bingham, on tonight. And last week, Dr. Bingham blessed us with a powerful lesson on last week. And this lesson last week was about the passion of pursuing the truth. And his three points was the warning concerning prophecies, the work connected to prophecies, and the withdrawal commanded from the prophecies. And what a powerful note I gleaned from his lesson on last week. Because he stated, when you are on fire for the Lord, you cannot help but speak the things that you have seen and heard. Wow, when you on fire for the Lord, you cannot help but speak of the things you have seen and heard. That's passion. Then he said, God did not call us to believe everything we heard. We must investigate those things that others claim to be true, regardless to who, to who said it. It doesn't matter who said it. If they say something that's from the Bible, we must investigate it ourselves. So thank you, Dr. Bingham, for a powerful lesson on last week. And you know, since the beginning, since the genesis of this Powerful Life Bible lesson this season, I've been discussing the what is your passion? And that, that's the question. And so I've been dealing with service. Or what is a true servant? What is a true service? And we, just a review, a true servant, we all know, is one who tries to please God alone. Because Matthew says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. And also a true service, a true servant, what does a true servant does? He finds it almost impossible to distinguish the, the small from the large. In other words, everybody is important. The aspect of ministry is big, even, even when it's not my idea. Even when it's somebody else's idea or somebody else's vision, the ministry is still big. And also, what is a true service, a true servant? A true servant is content in hiddenness. It does not need camera, lights, or action. When you're a true servant, you exercise in hiddenness. And also, what I like about a true servant, just a review, you place people over programs. You don't put programs over people because sometimes you have to counsel the program in order to meet the needs of people. Because a true servant serves those who are poor, the least, and also in need. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 19, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Just another review note from what is a true servant. A true servant serves friends as well as enemies. When you are a true servant of Christ, you have to serve everybody. You are everybody leaders. You everybody's pastor. You everybody's president. And also what I like about being a true servant is that he or she stays in their own lane. And that's where I am. I'm, I'm one who stays in my lane. Because if every vehicle stay in that lane, trust me, there will be any 
accidents on the freeway. But I also, what I like about true service, true service is a lifestyle. It's not only a language, it's a lifestyle. And we know the symbol of the true service is a towel. It's not a whistle, it's not a horn. You know, many of us walk around with a clipboard. No, the symbol of a true service, a true servant, is a towel. And we didn't understand that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He was example teaching us how to serve others. And tonight, we're still talking about the servant. There, there, there's so much in here. You know, I'm like the old preacher. I, I never finished, so I just continued next, the following week. So tonight we're going to talk about how can the servant, how can a true servant of Christ avoid the snares of Satan? Because once you commit, once you give your life, your heart, once you give your life to Christ, that's when a bullseye is written on your chest and your back for Satan to be a target. So, yes, I thought that giving your life to Christ was going to cause Satan to leave you alone. No, that's when life really happens. That's when issues and, and decision making really begins. When you give your life or you commit your life to Christ. So what is my scripture on tonight? First Peter 5 and 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion. Walking about, seeking to whom he may devour. Look what the message Bible say. <laughs> Keep a cool head. Stay alert. The devil is poised to pounce and would like nothing better than to catch you napping. <laughs> the devil, 1 Peter 5 and, says, 5 and 8 says, he's as a roaring lion, walking about seeking to whom he may devour. So once you commit once you get active, once you say, for God I live and for, for, for God I die, Satan began to put a, 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 a 911 call on you. you know, he, he, uh, uh, he, he begins to search you and, and look for you so he may devour you. He, he's coming after you. Bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? What you going to do when he comes for you? What should a true service, a true servant do? Watch this. A true servant always believe that Satan, the devil, or the enemy is real. This is the third time in this letter Peter has compelled and urged his readers to listen, to be sober, and to have a clear mind. This is the third time Peter said this. First Peter 1 and 13, he said, Therefore, with minds that are alert and sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. That's the first time. The second time, First Peter 4 and 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, it is to be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. It matters that we are paying attention to this serious minds and what's going on in our lives. Why? Because as, as believers, as Christians, as believers, we must keep in mind that the devil is always plotting, planning, programming, or sending a predicament or a person to be used at his vehicle to devour us. Why? Because he wants to make sure that we have permanent scars 
stains and insecurities. Let me read that again. As believers, as Christians, we must keep in mind that the devil always have a plot, plan, program, predicament, or person to be the vehicle to devour us and cause a permanent scar, permanent stain, or insecurities. The Greek word for devour means to swallow or means to drown. Peter has made it clear that our place in eternity with Jesus, with Christ, is sealed, stamped, and secure. And the devil knows it. The devil knows that our eternal security is sealed, stamped, and secure. So what Satan want to do to us leaders, what Satan wants to do to us servers, is that he wants to depress us, discourage us, and damage us on our way to eternity. We know what John 10 and 10 says. The thief comes to what? Kill, steal, and to ultimately destroy. He don't just, he could stop at steal, but he didn't stop at steal because anything you lose, you find. He didn't stop at kill because anything that's dead, you can revive. But his ultimate goal is to destroy us. You know, we just have 4th of July. His ultimate goal is, to, is for us to explode. It's for us to lose our identity. So when others see us, we are not recognizable. So what should we do? How can we avoid the snares of Satan? How can we avoid the plot, plan, the plot plans, programs, predicaments, and certain people? How can we prevent from having permanent scars, stains, and insecurities. Three things, and we're leaving. The first thing that we must not do in order to avoid the snares of Satan is number one, don't stray. S T R A Y. Don't stray. Psalms 119, 67. Therefore, I was afflicted and I went astray, but now I keep your word. Look what the writer says. I was afflicted and I went astray. You see, a true servant cannot stray, cannot neglect their prayer life. You cannot neglect your personal Bible study time. You cannot neglect your meditation. All of that is needed in order to avoid the snares of Satan. Watch this. It's amazing. Spiritual growth is the only thing so-called Christians say they can do on their own. When it comes to growing spiritually, we're the only ones that can say we can do it on our own. We wear other people's clothing. We drive other vehicles. We, we get on other people's planes. We get on boats made by others. We eat food cultivated by others. We read books written by others. We dance to music sang by others. We talk on cell phones invented by others. But when it comes to spiritual growth, we say that we can do it all alone. And that's one of the tricks of Satan. Because his trick, his desire is to isolate us. Because the servant must guard a servant must protect, a servant must develop their own devotional life by what? Drawing, nearing to God, when? Daily. Even in the martyr prayer, Jesus says, give us this day our what? Daily bread. Not weekly bread, not monthly bread, not anniversary bread, but give us our Daily bread. It's a daily activity. We must talk to God daily. We must meditate daily. We must worship daily. How can we avoid the snares? 
We're talking about don't stray. James 4 and 7. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will draw near to you. He will draw near to you if you come near to him. In other words, praying keeps you from straying. <laughs> if you don't want to stray, I dare you to pray. I dare you to pray. 70% of the prayers in the Bible was answered. 70%. Some yes, some no, and some not yet. Now, when God answered no, guess what? He still gave you an answer. So no is the answer. So 70% of the Bible, of the press of the Bible, were answered. So what does that mean? That means, and I know the Powerball and the Mega Million is hot this week, but guess what? What that means is you have a better chance with prayer than you do with the lottery. You have a 70% 70, 70 chance to hear from God when you pray. Because praying keeps us for straying. Grandma, what's that song? Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. Here, I will thank this cry. He will answer by and by just a little talk with Jesus makes it all right. So if we're going to avoid the snares of Satan, number one, don't stray. Leaders, don't stray. We must have a devotional life. Before the praise team gets up, we should already be prayed up. Before the deacons start devotion, we should already be devoted. Why? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So leaders, don't stray. Draw near to God. Talk to him. Talk to him. Don't stray. Number two, don't strut. S-T-R-U-T. Not only should we not stray, but we should not strut. This is a big one. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a hearty spirit before a fall. What does the message Bible says? First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. I love the message Bible. Read it again. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. You see, one of Satan's most effective weapon is pride, arrogance, selfishness, me, myself, and I. That's his favorite or one of his most effective weapons is pride. He does not care about our positions. As a matter of fact, he wants us to have a position in the church. <laughs> he wants us to have a title in the church. That doesn't bother him. Watch this, Ephesians 6 and 12, what does it say? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, here we go, against principality, against powers, ruler of darkness of the world, against spiritual weaknesses in where? High places. The higher you go, the more Satan want you. The higher you go in God, the more Satan can use you. So having a position doesn't discourage him. 
Matter of fact, he grins. He's, he's happy when you have a higher position. But what we must do is what many of us don't. We must, many of us lacks humility. We lack humility. Many servants, watch this, they seek attention and sponge up all the credit for their hard work and time and energy. <laughs> Many of us, like attention, when the program goes well, we want the credit. We did it. Call my name. If it wasn't for me, the program would not have worked. No, 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 no. What does John 12 and 43 says? For the love, for the love, the praise of men is more than the praise of God. Your service to God, listen to me. Your service to God and others does not have to be advertised announce or acknowledge for God to bless you. Whatever we do for Christ, whatever you do for the kingdom, whatever you do does not have to be advertised, announced or acknowledged in honor for God to bless you. Because everything we're doing, we're doing it for his glory. Yes, it's good for people to say good job but just in case they don't and most of the time they won't you don't need man approval for God to give you the anointing God can bless you in spite of not being advertised announced or acknowledged Jesus is our perfect example of humility even he said, John 8 and 28, I cannot do nothing of myself. I depend on my father. Even Jesus had to put away pride. Humility, I believe, is one of Jesus' greatest attributes. Yes, God himself he could have came as a giant. He could have came in a 747 airplane. But yet he humbled himself. Came in the form of a servant. Came as a baby. Watch this. You can, pro you, you can pronounce the word humble without the H. <laughs> and yet the word would still be effective. You can't announce the word humble without the H. And yet the word will still, will still be effective. Some say humble and some say humble. Regardless how you say it, with the H or without the H, it's still the same. And the H doesn't mind. We must be just like the H. If they call our name or not, we will be fine. So leaders, we must watch pride. There was a story about a snake in a forest. And, and this snake was on the branch of a tree. And this snake was looking at this larger snake. And the larger snake was bragging on himself. And this larger snake, every time he says something about himself, he will wrap himself around the limb. The larger snake would say, huh, I'm longer than you. He wrapped himself around the limb. I'm stronger than you. He wrapped himself around the limb. I'm bigger than you. He wrapped himself around the limb. Ultimately, he wrapped himself so many times. He killed himself and died. Ultimately, the Bible says, pride goes before 
destruction. So we must put pride to the side and stay humble. How can we avoid the snatch of Satan? Don't stray. Don't strut. But lastly, don't stoop. S-T-O-O-P. Don't stoop. Romans 12 and 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. The morals of today's society is at an all-time low. Many good people are being mistreated, misled, mishandled, misjudged, as all, and also misunderstood. And many churchgoers are effectively, we, we are effective either directly or indirectly by such morals. Even such act is deliberately aimed towards a servant or churchgoer. Even when an act is deliberately aimed at a churchgoer or a servant, the text shows us what not to do. He shows us not how to respond, how to retaliate, and how to seek revenge. When something happens to us as a leader, when we are mistreated, when we are misled, when we are mishandled, when we are misjudged, when we are misunderstood, this text demonstrates to us how to respond, how to retaliate, and how to seek revenge. Look what it says. Watch words. Do not, it's real simple, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <laughs> One of Satan's tricks is to isolate us and tell us that we are the only ones going through what we're going through. It's amazing. Every time we go through something, we think that we're the only one going through it, that we're the only one have experiences. That's one of the tricks of Satan. First Peter 2 and 21. To this you were called because Christ suffered you, leaving you an example that you should what? Follow in his steps. See, many desire to embrace the gains of Christ with Dr. Payne's of Christ. If Christ suffered, if Christ was misled, if Christ was misjudged, if Christ was misunderstood, who am I to say I should not be mistreated, misled, or mishandled, misjudged, or misunderstood? And yes, I do understand that there is no hurt like church hurt. There's no hurt like family hurt. There's no hurt for trusting someone who, who you love dearly. You spend all your time and energy with this person and they hurt you in the long run. I like what Michelle Obama said. What did she tell us? When they go high, when they go low, we go high. When Satan goes low, we go high. When people treat you evil, overcome evil with good. Satan can tempt you, he can tease you, he can taunt and terrify. He can tease, tempt, taunt, and terrify. 
but he can't not touch you. And he knows it. He knows he can't touch your soul because he need God's permission. God put burglar bars around our soul. God have a watchdog around our soul. And Satan needs permission. He cannot tempt, touch, tease, or terrify. Because one thing about Satan, you know, it's like those uh, superhero cartoons. When the villain couldn't get Superman, then he moved to Lois Lane. You know, when, when the villain couldn't get Spider-Man, he moved to Mary Jane. You see, if Satan cannot get you, he'll get at you. <laughs> but he's not going to stop until he damage, discourage you, or depress you. Because look what it says. He's seeking whom he may devour. He, watch this. He's like a roaring lion. Like a roaring. In other words, watch the metaphor. He's like a roaring lion. In other words, he only has a sound with no teeth. <laughs> He's just making noise. Why? Because ultimately, he wants us to act just like him. And that's what it's all about. You know, a class clown is not funny in the classroom if nobody else is laughing. So Satan is acting up, and he needs an audience. Look at the end. Satan is not after your position. He's after your posture. He's not after your position as pastor, as president, as minister of music, as chairman of deacons, as Sunday school teacher. He's not after your position. He's after your posture. He's after your character. Because if you get it right, your wife get it right, kids get it right, community get it right, co-workers get it right, the mailman get it right, the milkman get it right, the kids in the neighborhood get it right. But it starts with you. Come here, old deacon, Lord, send a revival. But let it begin with me. Father God, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for challenging us because we realize that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he doesn't mind for us to have a position in the church. But allow us, Lord, not to be concerned about the position, but be concerned about our posture how we treat people, how we love one another, how we devote it in your word, prayer, Bible study, meditation, feeding the poor, visiting the sick, doing those things that's about the kingdom. Those are the things he don't want us to do. He want us to have pride and say, look what I've done. But even you said yourself, Lord, not my will, but your will. So help us, Lord, to do it your way. Because again, this is your church and our desire is not only look like you, but to serve like you with a towel. In Jesus' name, amen.